Okay, I want to start again now picking up the theme of gender socialization, but now turning to a comparison between uh, the, the kind of gender identities that we're familiar with and that completely dominate the literature on the psychological development of children, that is, um, gender as understood in weird societies, weird being an acronym for Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, um, which anthropologists have been at pains to emphasize are not uh, not normal uh, or representative of the societies in the world. So gender in the West um, and gender in the area of the world that is commonly known as Melanesia in the Western Pacific. Now I want to suggest that in the West and in the examples that I've just presented and that I hope you'll look more at in preparation for you to tour, tutorial discussions is that um, gender identity is mediated through mass-produced and mass-marketed commodities. And part of the way that children become gendered is as consumers. They are um, invoked as gendered persons when they're confronted with products in stores or restroom signs and, and this kind of thing. Um, in contrast, in Melanesia, I'd propose that gender identity is mediated very importantly by producing and distributing food and other things that are locally produced. So rather than being gendered as consumers of mass products, it's the acts of giving and receiving that are um, gendered. But in Melanesia, it's not just um, as a boy or as a girl, as a man or as a woman that one is gendered, but the gender is really significantly embedded in social relationships, brother-sister, a cross-sex sibling relationship versus a same-sex sibling relationship maybe more important than just boy, girl, husband, wife, son, mother, and the articulation of all of those different gendered relationships is central to understanding what gender means in a kin-based society in a way that it perhaps is not in a more fragmented, more nuclear family oriented, more institutionalized and bureaucratized um, society like the one that we live in. So I'm not going to get into the details of all that kinship material, but I really want to flag it and I will be talking about cross-sex sibling relationships. Um, and finally, and again, I just want to flag this for you to think about. One of the weird things about that last slide, the slide of the um, little doll girl winning beauty pageants, is that from um, that we are recently gendering children in a really marked manner in a way that is weird in the scope of human societies and even in our own history that that kids are kind of presented as girls and boys very very young even before before two uh, which is very unusual um, and the other thing is that in a certain way you're once a woman you're always a woman and and on the other end of life too, there's a celebration of um, sexuality and sexual identity into later life. So a postmenopausal woman is um, still supposed to be as much a woman, as much a sexual being as somebody who's premenopausal. Men, you know, are not expected to kind of put aside sexual um, the centrality of sexuality to their being as they age, um, hence Viagra and things. So one's a gendered and sexed person kind of consistently throughout our lifetimes. So you can debate that. That's a striking contrast to many traditional societies in which gender and sexual identity is really only highlighted in the period of childbearing where the reproductive function is actually kind of active from puberty to menopause for women. And this is particularly notable for women particularly notable where women are excluded from certain kinds of male activities, especially male ritual activities. Often, men of postmenopausal women get to do male stuff. 
their gender becomes less important as their reproductive function ends. So, so, so that the gendering is a much more age-specific thing. Okay, turning to Melanesia, now I will show you a map. Um, my pointer doesn't seem to work in the lecture capture, but um, you've got the main island of Melanesia, where, which I will be, um, uh, main island of Papua New Guinea. To the north, that small island above the Bismarck Sea there is Manus Island, uh, which is of course in the news and is a site of fieldwork of the, uh, Margaret Mead that I'll be talking about. Um, the uh, conservation area there is in the Sepik region, so I'll also be talking about an area um, on the north coast, following the Sepik River from the north coast, and I'll be talking about some of my own work um, in the Solomon Islands. Um, and here is a expanded map, uh, Solomon Islands on the uh, right side of the picture, and here's an expanded map and an expansion of the New Georgia group where I worked, and the island of Renonga on the very western end, the long skinny island is, is the island of Renonga. Now, I didn't study gender socialization in particular uh, during my fieldwork, although it's something I'm um, increasingly interested in, but it was clear that uh, gender was expressed in different ways in the Solomons than it is um, here in Western Australia or in the US where I grew up. Obviously, um, no, uh, not a lot of uh, Disney princesses, not a lot of pink and blue. One of the very first ways in which I um, became aware of children's and gender differences was swimming off of the beach in the hamlet where I stayed. When a young girl was about six at the time, called me in, my, 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 come, 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 Deborah, come back, come back, come back. I said, okay, come back. She said, ah, us girls, we don't swim over there. We don't swim over there. So she knew she was not allowed to go towards the point in closing the bay because that was a sacred site. And while everyone is Christian and most of the sacred sites are thought to be cool, this was one that was still thought to be hot and dangerous to, um, to girls and women. Another really obvious way that children express their gender was in ways of working. And as we'll see in more detail in another ethnography I'm going to discuss, um, play and work are perhaps more closely connected in traditional societies than they are in our own. But even in our own societies, little girls and little girl boys play at the work that they see their parents doing, they often tend to play at the work they see um, the parent of the gender they are identifying with doing. Both men and women in the Solomon Islands do a lot of carrying. Um, that's one with no roads um, and a lot of heavy paths and gardens of fairway inland. Carrying is very important. Women carry heavy loads of firewood and of foodstuffs and little girls very early carry as well and as you'll see the little girl on the right she's carrying a net string bag and she's carrying it on her head which is um, a way of carrying that only women do and that is also is really distinctive of women. Little boys carry things as well as do men they do not carry them with a um, a string bag over their head, they carry them in bags upon their shoulders by and large. So these little boys are working in a community project to make a gravel path. They're carrying a pretty hefty load of gravel in reused rice bags up, up to the path. You've also got differences, um, some differences in, in the kinds of subsistence activities that women and girls versus boys and men do. Girls and boys both fish. Girls, uh, women fish uh, on the reefs and men tend to do deep sea fishing. Both women and men are very good at paddling canoes, but it's the little boys who tend to all have their canoes and who paddle them quite a distance out. So you've got 
kids who would be closely supervising the water, little boys who are who are doing a, a fair amount of paddling in, in pretty deep water. And when they capsize, they just laugh and climb back up. So little girls also paddle canoes, but not as often or as frequently as little boys. One thing that is very marked in what little girls do is they look after little kids. So here are two young girls of about seven and eight carrying my uh, very large by local standards, 18-month-old daughter, Anna, um, when we were there in 2010. And Anna was always um, picked up and carried by little girls. Now, here, men and women dote over children and play with young children, but it's um, young girls who, uh, often five-year-olds will try to pick up babies as well, but only the eight-year-olds could manage our little monster here. Here's a picture of Jean Tolly and Nasoni, little uh, a, a, a brother and a sister, and they're looking at um, tuna that have been caught. One of the um, really striking things about watching kids interact was, although nobody said boys act like this, bo girls act like this, don't act like that, that's what boys do, a little bit of pressure, especially for church, that girls wore dresses and boys wore trousers, but dress also didn't mark kids. But what was explicitly discussed was how brothers and sisters should treat each other. The brother-sister relationship in this society, which is a matrilineal society, which Richard has talked about, that relationship is incredibly important. Matrilineal society is one in which clan membership is passed not through um, the father's line, as we think about surnames often traditionally being passed down from a father to his children, but through the mother's side. So a child is the clan of his or her mother. But power is vested in men. And that gives the sister-brother relationship a really important structural role insofar as the brother has sort of power and authority over his sister's children. Brother, brothers and sisters are both the most, the relationship of greatest solidarity, and this is signaled, especially when people use terms for brother and sister that, um, folk, that, that emphasize age. So you can either call someone an older sibling or a younger sibling, um, that, and that's an ungendered term, and that really connotes a relationship of nurture and care and working together. Brothers and sisters share property in common. Act like brothers and sisters to one another. Act like siblings to one another because you must you know, share and, 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 and treat yourselves as one, your siblings. There's this real solidarity. But between cross-sex siblings, brothers and sisters, there's a relationship of avoidance. Avoidance um, as the children grow, uh, the, the brother cannot hold his sister's clothing. The sister cannot touch her brother's head. Um, the sister can't be above the brother. So higher houses of the sort that people are building now are problematic if women are above the men and sisters in particular are above their brothers. So little girls are told, tambu nana, tambu, forbidden. Don't step over your brother's legs. You know, that's your brother. You don't giggle in front of him. And as is so often the case, the, the weight of these behaviors, the weight of um, observing these behaviors falls more on sisters than brothers. When I ask people, they said, ah, yes, brothers should respect and um, treat their sisters with a certain deference too. But in observing what happened, it was usually the sisters who were told to respect and defer to their brothers. So that pattern became really noticeable as children moved out of their early children, two to six, and in, in becoming sort of prepubescent, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and was really marked during puberty when those avoidance relationships were, um, w were very stringently enforced. There were exceptions for much older sisters and much younger brothers, especially sisters who'd been really involved in the brother's um, care as an infant. 
so that there's a sense that you couldn't really treat with respect anybody whose diaper you changed. Um, but then those sibling relationships were assimilated to um, parent-child, so it was the older sister was addressed as a, as a mother. Okay. Child socialization has been a really central question in anthropology for a very long time and was central in the work of probably one of the most influential anthropologists ever, certainly the most influential anthropologist in America in the 20th century, Margaret Mead. Um, Margaret Mead, from the beginning, um, was focused on girls and women, um, in contrast to most other, most ethnographers were men, and um, Mead was intensely interested in the lives of women uh, as part of the broader society. So generalizations about anthropology neglecting women into the 1970s are really um, often overlook Mead's important work. And she was very, very interested in children because if you believe, as she did and was taught by her mentor, Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict, if you believe that we are really powerfully who we, we are, what we are, and we act the way we do, not because of how we're born, but because of the culture and society around us, then by looking at how children are socialized, you can see those processes, you can see, you can, you can see them in a way, they become explicit in a way that they might not be for fully grown adults. So her first book published in 1928, when she was only 27 years old, which just blows my mind, was Coming of Age in Samoa, Psychological Study of Primitive Youth for Western Civilization. The punchline of that was that the adolescent drama that we in the West, in America, take as natural around sexuality, it, it, this isn't inevitable. You don't see it at all in the same form in, um, in Samoa. Their youth were very much on their own. There was a lot of peer socialization and a lot of love affairs. And she got, um, she's been taken to task for overemphasizing the promiscuity of Samoan youth, um, but the real core point was, look, other people do it differently. We don't have to live in this way. We might want to think about other ways of living, and that is one of the reasons she was has been so influential. She wrote in a way that um, she wrote for a broad public. She didn't write for specialists and her work's been picked up and used in many different sorts of ways in fem within feminism as a, as a social movement. So if you're curious about Margaret Mead, there is a fantastic interactive online exhibition of Mead's work at the Library of Congress put up um, in celebration of the 100th anniversary of her birth um, in 2001. Beautiful pictures, many of which I've put on the following slides, some and, and quite brief, succinct descriptions of her fieldwork and her um, findings. She did fieldwork um, by herself in Samoa and with her second husband, Rio Fortune, in um, Manus Island and in the Sepik region, and then her third husband, Gregory Bateson. So this is also partners working in partnership. And this is a picture of Manus boys in Perry um, in this beautiful floating village. So after coming of age in Samoa, she thought, you know, to really get a child socialization, I want to look at pre-adolescent kids, what's going on with pre-adolescent kids. And she also wanted to document um, societies that were changing very, very rapidly in the 20th century. So she didn't want to go back to Samoa. She went to Papua New Guinea and she went to Manus Island in um, uh, uh, a lagoon-based um, village called Perry. Now there, she was interested because in the ways that children were at the center of their parents' world and that fathers were incredibly involved in child care and, and caregiving. And in fact, she depicted quite um, hostile relationships between husbands and wives, and, and, ra and it was not necessarily a nice, happy nuclear family, but uh, the, uh, the mother and father actually competed for the attention and affection of um, children, especially once they were mobile um, and, and less attached to the breastfeeding mother around age two. Um, she documented the relatively um, undifferentiated treatment of children up to about age 
four, five, six, seven, when they started to play in more sex differentiated groups with um, more emphasis on the kinds of activities that they saw their mothers and their fathers doing, but a fair degree of interaction. She was really, really struck by the way that the world of children was very different than the world of adults. They, they played at certain kinds of work that adults did, but they didn't, they showed no interest up until the point of their marriage in the things that were most important to adults, especially trade. There was a lot of trade. She characterized this as a highly competitive society, like American society, the American Society of Our Readers. Um, they showed no interest in spirit life, which went against some prominent theories of child development developed in the West that said children had this kind of fantasy life and attributed um, power to supernatural agents and fantasy, and she didn't find any of that. She said, Manus children live in a world of their own based on different premises from those of adult life. Um, so the puzzle of that ethnography was then, how do children socialized in one way come to act as competent adults. These children and young people were cooperative, not competitive like adult life. They, they just weren't interested. And, and the answer um, has to do with social structure and the structures of marriage and the ways that um, uh, men climb status hierarchies and the ways that women are moved from their natal homes into the homes of their husbands where they're very much strangers. And so it has to do with the the structure of society that in a way she depicted as kind of conflicting with the personalities of, of, of Manus people. The work in which Mead really debunked the idea that certain temperaments, as she called them, certain kinds of personalities were associated naturally with men versus women was in a book called Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies. And I should say that this is a book of the early 20th century. We no longer use the term primitive um, in the ways that Margaret, Margaret Mead did, but she didn't mean it in a derogatory way. She, she was talking about um, non-complex societies, but of course the word primitive is valid um, to, it's, it's worth critiquing that word. So she, she, with her husband, Rio Fortune, um, went back to Papua New Guinea, and were, um, began in a mountain uh, village near the coast among Arapesh speakers, spent uh, the better part of a year there, moved inland along the Sepik River to another group, not very far inland, but a very different cultural group, the Mundagumar, which are now called the Biwat, people, the language speakers, and then further along to Lake Chambri, which Mead and Fortune um, wrote as Chambuli, in, further inland. Melanesia is one of the most diverse, um, linguistically diverse regions of the world. It's incredibly interesting for studying cultural variation because within very short, very small distances and, and groups that are in intense contact with each other, there are these really highly elaborated um, different differences. And what me found was that temperament, just basically how men and women act in society, how they behave towards one another, how they comport themselves, that they were radically different in these three societies. That she believed there was a spectrum of human temperaments and behaviors. Wasn't exactly sure how those, that spectrum was shaped. She said, you know, we don't understand the mechanics. There's nature and there's nurture in there. Um, that's a story that has been filled in a lot in 20th century um, and 21st century neuroscience. She said, there's a spectrum. But what I'm concerned with, what I'm interested in as an anthropologist is how that within this diversity of human behavior and personality, in certain societies, some types are valorized and others are discouraged. And the deviants in one society are actually, would be really well suited in another society. She was looking for differences in men and women, but what she found in the first, those first two societies was actually that there was very little difference in temperament between men and women. 
So among the Arapesh is a wonderful ethnographic description of this um, society. She said, both men and women here are what we would think of as feminine, peaceful, non-confrontational, intensely concerned with the nurture of children and the nurture of food for feeding the children. There are, um, um, it's not just mothers who make a child's body. The father makes it through insemination and there was a thought that you don't get pregnant by just one act of intercourse. It requires a quarter of ongoing work of sex. And sex was considered work and also somewhat dangerous. Um, but fathers make the child's body not only through sexual acts, but through feeding, which of course is a really obvious and really physical way that we make people. So the, the father is nurturing. The father is maternal in that sense. Um, children very early are taught to associate food with supportive and loving relationships. They're not, they're taught to address um, siblings and in-laws with kin terms that are not highly differentiated. So um, they're not too worried about, you know, is this a mother's brother, is this a brother, or is this or mother's brother, is this a father? It's like the, gen the age generation of nurturing people. So it's a very nurturing sort of beautiful, depicted uh, she depicts it as a beautiful society they're discouraged con from conflict um, so little kids are stopped from beating each other up by and large um, and there's not a lot of tolerance for temper when expressed against others if, if kids get angry they may go hit something but they're not permitted to hit other kids and um, slightly more tolerance for temper for, for boys than for girls Men and women also show those temperamental um, qualities, although men sometimes step into the role of leader and kind of cultivate a more aggressive persona. But as Mead depicts it, this is a bit of a burden. Even within marriage, the ideal um, was that young girls would be betrothed, they would move to their, the, hamlet, uh, the, the household of their um, father, or their um, soon-to-be husband who is older, and that whole family, the whole group of brothers, would basically feed this little girl. And so they became, the in-laws became like parents, and eventually the marriage was consummated when the girl had gone through ceremonies associated with adolescence, and but the, the, she depicts marriage as a kind of nurturing, nurturant, um, situation in which the husband is nonetheless older and therefore do dominant over the woman, but it's, a, but, but it's not a kind of hostile and aggressive sort of dominance. Sexuality was thought to be dangerous insofar as it, um, men ha held especially the supernatural power over making yams and other gardens grow and that close contact with female reproductive power could be dangerous to male growth and the growth of food. So there was gender segregation and um, in, in processes, especially of initiation, but um, Mead, Mead characterizes this as complementary and oriented towards the growth of one another and the growth of children. And then they went inland, and among the Mundagumar, they um, Mead characterizes both men and women as what we would think of as masculine, aggressive, confrontational, warlike, individualistic, volatile, passionate. Sex is a matter of almost, almost non-consensual rape um, as the initiation of, of sexual activities, and, and that there's a certain valorization of capture within um, sexual and romantic affairs. She documented um, much less um, play between a, a, mother, a mother and a nursing baby. And in fact, I'm gonna jump ahead to this picture of an Arapish woman nursing a baby and me talks of the long languorous sessions of nursing with a lot of play and talk and singing around it and the, the um, Mundagomar woman kind of holding on to the child nursing while 
standing up, the kid nurses quickly. He's got to get the milk out and then is put in a, in a bag that doesn't hang as closely to the mother's body as to do the net bags of the Rathish women. So, uh, so um, not as much doting affection on, on infants. Um, and she discusses a kind of development of hostility between mothers and daughters and fathers of son who for complicated reasons come to see each other as competitors. There's a sharp division that children are forced to di um, distinguish between different categories of relatives on their two sides and behave in very different ways with them. Some they can joke with, others they have to respect. And there's just a lot of aggressive play and people, children are socialized to be aggressive. Now, finally, among the Chambri, she found um, gender differentiation in temperament. Women were different than men. Women were thought to be different than men. Women comported themselves differently than men. But, and the, conf the, the contrast is almost too neat, she found that they comported themselves and had temperaments that were the opposite of what her American readers would expect for men and women. It was the men here who were flighty, emotional, concerned with the parents, concerned with ceremony. It was the women who were practical, were thought to have a head for money and trade, who managed the economic life of the society. They also had a say in their marriage, and there were various, the courting went both ways. This wasn't a society in which women were in any simple sense dominant, and later ethnographers have come to question that and have said, look, Cham this was a particular situation in the 30s there, Chambry, men have always um, been politically dominant, but Mead made a really important point in the, in the centrality of women to the um, economic life, and they're different, they're different sphere. Okay, I've already shown you that. Now the final example, here's our map of Papua New Guinea again, is um, from Bosavi area of the Highland Fringe, so about where the word Papua New Guinea is in that, in that map. Um, Kaluli people who've been studied really intensely. Some of the, uh, one of, a couple of my favorite ethnographies um, are of the Kaguli, and one of them is the one I'm going to talk about, Bambi Shefflin, the give and take of everyday life language socialization of Kaluli children. Um, and I've scanned an, a short excerpt describing children's play among the Kaluli that I'd like you to read um, as uh, preparation for the tutorial. Um, the other, other books have have, and, and musical work by Stephen Feld, an ethnomusicologist, has documented the amazing songs um, of the Kaluli. And Edward L. Shefflin wrote a book um, called The Sorrow of the Lonely and the Burning of the Dancers about Kaluli, traditional Kaluli ceremonial life. But The Give and Take It of Everyday Life is a microethnography of four children. It's a beautiful book. I envy Bambi Shefflin's amazing rigor in her methodology. She spent an intense amount of time in these families and recorded the everyday um, conversations between how mothers are teaching children to talk and in, in the context of, of other children, young children, other family members, and especially um, especially young girls. And you can ask people about language, and you get certain answers. But what Shefflin did is at the core of pretty much what, at the core of anthropology and sociology is to say, OK, you say this, but what do you actually do in practice, including in language practice? So it's focused on four children, many hundreds of hours of tape, laboriously transcribed with her, um, with, often with the mothers of the children. Um, she found that from, uh, from babyhood to about three years old, children were in very close contact with their mothers, unlike Manus fathers who took their children around when they went around. Uh, Kaluli fathers tended not to take their children, so children, except when they were up away from the village processing the sago trees that provide the main starch for the, for the family, uh, unless they were away in those camps uh, for a few days to a week at a time, the children weren't on a daily basis spending their w hours with their 
with their father. So there's an asymmetrical relationship between little girls and little boys, and that little boys spend a lot of time with their moms, but not their dads, and little girls spend a lot of time with their same-sex parent. As everywhere else, um, the children play at uh, the work that they see their um, same-sex parent doing, and that is uh, described in the excerpt um, th that I've um, shared there with the little girls from the age of three on trying to take care of babies and actually effectively um, cooking, little boys playing with pigs and hunting and things. In ter terms of language learning, um, Shefflin uh, documents in great detail the ways that children are taught to assert themselves or say said you know give it to me say it you know say it give it to me they're taught to and a lot of these language socialization socialization occurs around food so give that food to me or I'm not going to give you any because you are um, you're making me angry so giving requesting refusing and offering food is at the center of socialization and indeed at the center of Kalili social life until about six to eight months, baby girls and baby boys are treated similarly, but she says at about six to eight months, which is about the time that babies, when they don't have other things like dummies and plastic toys, start to bite at breasts, the mothers begin to act quite differently towards boy babies and girl babies. This despite the fact that if you ask them, they won't really express very much um, very many ideas about how girls and boys ought to behave or how they ought to be trained to behave. But at that point, as the baby is starting to play at the breast and bite and tee, the mother will basically pull the little girl off the breast, turn her around, face her to other people and not engage with her. For the little boy, she'll take the breast away, she'll play with him, she'll tell, tell him no, but not take him away so he does it again so and she teases him and tickles him and so there's a certain in Shefflin's um, explanation there's a certain excitement teasing playfulness that little boys are sort of socialized to associate with eating and food that little girls are not consistently as children start eating food boys are given more food they're especially given more meat. They're served first. As they play, as you'll see in the excerpt, they are allowed to be the center of attention. Girls are discouraged from making themselves the center of attention. If a girl has a temper tantrum, she's told to leave the room. If a boy has a temper tantrum, the mother coddles him and talks him down and calls him down. So they're taught to emotionally respond in quite different ways. With little boys cult being cultivated to have these quite intense kind of emotional um, emotional responses that is if you read um, Edward Shefflin and Stephen Fell's discussion of ceremonial life really comes out in Kalilu ceremony where men are extremely emotional and are, all that ceremony is very much about eliciting tears and eliciting emotions. Um, and the other point that I've already emphasized in talking about Renanga is that um, there's a really different relationship between same-sex siblings, sisters and sisters and brothers and brothers, and cross-sex siblings, brothers and sisters. Same-sex siblings are encouraged to cooperate, to work together on things. It's an anecdote about a little boy who's three, who plays with his baby, he's talking to his baby, he has, says, here, take this, and it's a stick, and it's a stick on which they're going to carry something. So they play at working together to carry something. And little girls are encouraged to work together, to cook together. But little boys and little girls, little boys and their older sisters more particularly, which is a culturally really significant relationship, again, one that is sung about and wept about in the, in the, in the ceremonial song cycles, that older sibling, older sister, younger brother relationship is one that is a teasing one, that's an aggressive one. And little boys are taught to act aggressively towards their older sisters. And those older sisters are taught to submit to their aggression. And it's all very subtle, and it's, um, and it's, uh, it's 
often not really harmful physical aggression, but it's subtly socializing little girls and little boys to be very different, well, maybe not very different, but to be different kinds of people, to be more different, to be sure, than, um, than they in any way naturally are. So have a look at, at those few pages of the give and take in every day, of everyday life for a, um, a detailed description of some of the play among um, little girls and little boys among the Kalini. So some final thoughts here. Practices of socialization, whether we're talking about North Fremantle or whether we're talking about the Kalui in the um, Papua New Guinea Highlands, do not require explicitly held or articulated beliefs about how boys and girls should act. It often occur, this practices of socialization are often not conscious and we're not even necessarily very aware of them. Then when children start acting in gender typical ways without any explicit teaching, this seems like proof that these behaviors are naturally gendered. I never taught my daughter to like pink. I actively discouraged her from liking pink. I even more actively discouraged the cult of the princess. And yet, she was obsessed with pink and princesses for a year of her life. It must be natural. Well, no. And hopefully you'll get to talk about what those um, other causes can be. There's a great variability in what different people take to be typically male and typically female characteristics. And there's also, as we saw from that comparison that Margaret Mead, this classic comparison of sex and temperament in three primitive societies, there's a great degree of variation in the extent to which women and men are seen to be different. And what's weird about our own society is I think in some ways we um, don't think adult women and men should be very different. And we've got ideologies of gender um, e equality and sameness that in many ways are not um, manifest in patterns of behavior, whether it's the gendered nature of children's clothing or the income discrepancies in um, between men and women or the incredible um, predominance of women in arts degrees and um, men in, say, engineering degrees. So those are things, um, yeah, there's a gap between ideology and practice. And then finally, the point is a methodological point that is Im important, and that is that by studying child socialization carefully, looking not just people what they, looking at people what people do, not just what they say, we can see many of the implicit and contradictory norms and values that we live by. So thank you for your attention, and um, I look forward to the tutorials. Let me do this. That final image. Thank you.